Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf. I am a staff writer at The Atlantic magazine. And I'm Mark Oppenheimer. I write the beliefs column for The New York Times. And uh, Mark and I actually know one another uh, originally because I was his student at NYU in a class on religion writing. I forget the title of the class, uh, but, but it was a good class. Uh, well, thank you. I, th I think you got an A, as I recall. So uh, <laughs> it's, I'm, gla I'm glad that you survived the class and, and, and throve afterwards. Yes. Um, let's see. So let's start by talking about uh, Maggie Gallagher, who mm -hmm. you just profiled. Uh, why don't you right. tell us about who she is and, uh, and your thoughts on profiling her? Sure. Well, Maggie Gallagher is uh, the founder of the National Organization for Marriage. Uh, she's no longer the head of it. But they are the uh, preeminent anti-gay uh, marriage, anti-same-sex marriage organization, or they might say the preeminent pro-traditional marriage organization. Right. Uh, they are the strategists as well as a lot of the money behind things like Proposition 8 in California or the anti-same-sex marriage legislation uh, in Maine. Um, they helped defeat three of the uh, Supreme Court justices in Iowa who, who ruled in favor of same-sex marriage. So they're very, very powerful. Uh, she's a conservative Catholic. She went to Yale College. And um, it struck me some six months ago that we knew very, very little about her. And so I began looking into her life. And it turned out that she had a, a pretty interesting story, which I wrote about for Salon uh, last week. And uh, she originally came to her, I guess, traditional family values through the experience of having a, a kid on her own and having the father... Right. That's my theory. So, right. The interesting story to which I alluded is that she, um, as a Yale undergraduate, as a senior at Yale College in 1982, this would have been, she was impregnated by a sophomore who was, uh, depending on whose story you believe, either her boyfriend or uh, perhaps a casual lover. Uh, they, they had different stories when I spoke to both of them, uh, as men and women will, in issues like this. And she, uh, she'd always been conservative. They, in fact, she knew the, the, the baby daddy through Yale campus conservative activism, through the Party of the Right, which is a, a Yale undergraduate organization. and But she had been kind of an Ayn Rand um, libertarian objectivist type, and she was not religious. She had, she had traveled far from her, her natal Catholicism. Her parents were pretty lapsed. She was pretty lapsed. So the reorientation of her conservatism away from a kind of economic uh, free market conservatism toward a really strong interest in family values came from the fact that at a very young age, she herself became a single mother. And she began thinking about how difficult it was to be a single mother. She began getting, getting very angry with liberals and feminists who she saw as uh, making it okay to be a single mother or perhaps um, even exalting it. Uh -huh. And um, she decided she was going to stop, stop them. Mm -hmm. And an interesting thing, I think, about her story, uh, as you get across in her piece, is that in, in one way, she had this very uh, personal reason for coming to mm -hmm. social conservatism. Uh, on the other hand, her advocacy on behalf of traditional marriage, uh, you know, the sorts of arguments that she makes and the way her writing comes across is, uh, is very dispassionate in a way. It's, it's not the sort of fire-breathing, gays are evil sort of uh, right. stuff you, you might expect uh, that, that you sometimes see from people making that argument. Uh, in fact, she is one of the people making that argument who is saying, you know, in theory, or I guess in practice, but she's saying that, uh, you know, on the whole, this is going to be mad, this is going to be a bad thing for society, and I don't have anything against gays, I just think that by marrying, they're sort of uh, going down this road that's going to be a bad norm that's going to affect lots of other things badly. Is that uh, right? She would she would say. I mean, it, it's very interesting. She and the other one of her her, her closest colleagues in the anti gay marriage fight, a guy named David Blankenhorn, um, uh -huh. who who says that he's a political liberal, says he voted for Obama last time around, um, uh, is a Presbyterian married to to a Jewish woman. Uh, I mean, both of them, and you know, of course, Maggie is is Yale educated. He's Harvard educated. The the two people who are sort of leading the anti gay marriage um, kind of thought machine are themselves people who I think are, um, they don't have, as far as I can tell, any personal animus towards gays. Now, the a, a lot of gay activists took me to task when I wrote that and said, oh, you can see all of these terrible things she said about gay people here, there, and the next place she has said that it's a dysfunction and that we should pour money into researching whether it can be cured. And it is true that if you look at her track record, she has, she has sounded all of those whistles of the anti-gay, you know, homophobic wing. But if you really look at what motivates her, if you look at what constitutes the vast majority of her and of David Blankenhorn's um, anti-gay marriage uh, writing, teaching, advocating, you'll see that it's more this kind of um, 
hard to pin down, slightly um, ephemeral sense that if what we really want uh, for children is strong marriage norms, then we really have to hold to the traditional notion of marriage. And every time we experiment with it, whether it's by making divorce easy through no-fault divorce, um, or by exalting single mothers in some way, or making that an okay norm for middle-class women, or they think by allowing same-sex couples to marry. Every time we tinker with that norm, we're making it harder for, for marriage to fulfill its core function. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things to say there is, of course, um, that's the kind of argument for which there's not really any evidence that they can adduce. I mean, what they're saying right. is, we can't tell you, you know, no, they're saying, hell will not freeze over when this happens, nothing will fall from the sky, but if you have a lot of states that allow gay marriage, uh, we can just have a strong hunch that 20, 30, 40 years from now, it will have led to bad things. Although, when the bad things come, like the dissolution of the family, we won't be able to actually say that it was because of gay marriage. We will never be able to untangle all the causation. So, it's re they're really asking you to take it on a kind of faith that if we know certain things about the family and, and marriage, we just have to know that gay marriage is a bad idea. Right. Um, yeah, so I suppose it's a little bit it's a little bit better than the than the pure tautological argument, the thing that you'll hear Rick Santorum say, right? That that marriage just is between a man and a woman. Yeah, I mean Maggie, I think her worst argument is that she also will make this kind of tautological definitional argument, which is we just know that's what marriage is, and um, you know. Of course, words, <laughs> words. In, unless you have a kind of religious attachment to uh, linguistic, to, to certain linguistic conventions, you, you have to know that, of course, marriage is just isn't just anything. Um, sometimes it's polygamous, and sometimes it, in history it's been also it's been a property transaction. And she believes that the essence of marriage you can't even you legitimately use the word unless it's between a man and a woman. That strikes me as her weakest. Uh, point, but no, that's not her central point. The way it is for someone like Santorum, and yeah. well, that's always so fascinating to me about uh, the way that tradition is invoked uh, when it comes to marriage. It's this, it's this weird ahistorical invocation of tradition where what's being invoked is sort of a 1950s sitcom version of marriage, as opposed to a uh, you know, you know, no one wants to say, well, traditionally polygamy. Uh, was you know practiced for hundreds of years, and we need to get right. back to this. Like no one would no one would credit that argument. Right. Uh, but but there is a deep and and I think earnest conviction among people that uh, that something important is changing that has been true for uh, you know all of Western civilization. And uh, yeah, I mean Maggie will even. <laughs> I mean, she'll even make the argument, if you push her on it, that at least in polygamous relationships, uh -huh. a child had access to its mother and father. <laughs> it might have okay. fairly limited access to its father, but at least the father was there. And of course, I, I can't remember if it was Santorum or somebody else who said, uh, you know, even if the father's in prison, a child at least knows where his father is, whereas when you're a lesbian sperm donor, maybe you don't know who your father is. And I mean, these are just kind of absurdities, obviously. Um, right. right. What they're really attached to is a pretty recent... Um, you know, they don't want to argue for arranged marriages or for um, polygamous marriages or for anything or, or for marriages driven in entirely by property transfer. Um, right. They do want to allow for some romance in marriage. They want a kind of post-Victorian notion of marriage, but one that stops around 1960. So they're arguing that the, the marriage norms that obtained in the Western world from maybe 1920, from sort of the, the, the current uh, Downton Abbey moment uh, through about, um, you know, Griswold v. Connecticut and, the, and birth control. Right. Uh, that's the marriage we need, <laughs> frozen in time. Right. Well, uh, I'll tell you, my, my take on gay marriage, I came to it in college. Um, I, I probably never even was aware of the issue when I was in high school. I graduated from high school in, in 1998 and went mm -hmm. off to college and started reading Andrew Sullivan relatively early in his time on the internet. And he was the first person that I ever read, you know, bringing up this issue at all. Uh, and at the time I was interacting with the first, uh, out gay people that I'd ever interacted with in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just seemed to make sense to me that, you know, you know, my RA in my sophomore dorm, I believe, was was gay, and uh, he was the first person I knew uh, very well who was gay, and he had a boyfriend, and it seemed perfectly natural. Their relationship seemed, you know, much like the relationships of other people I knew, uh, more healthy than right. the relationships of many people I knew. More healthy than many, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, it just seemed natural that uh, they, you know, 
if they dated long enough, uh, they would want to get married one day, that this would be something that they wanted. Um, and of course, uh, people of uh, Maggie Gallagher's uh, background uh, had solidified their ideas about what marriage is uh, at a much earlier stage in their life, and, and this whole political controversy didn't come along until much later. Uh, but, but what strikes me, I, I, so I see why she and I might have different, uh, different perspectives on it in that sense. Uh, in how natural it seems to us right. and how normal it seems to us. Um, at, at the same time, I, I can't wrap my mind around her confidence, or, or at least her purported confidence, that her side that is winning. going to come out on top. Yeah, um, it, And it's not just, I, I mean, I take her point that it's been put to a vote in different places and, and her side has won. Um, but, you know, we're seeing more and more state legislatures uh, vote for their, vote this into law. Uh, but, but more important to me, I mean, when you look at the numbers of what young people think about this, uh, it, it clearly the, the polling numbers are running in the wrong direction for her. And, and more importantly, I would argue that uh, although I do not think that all people who are against gay marriage are bigots, I, I don't think that Maggie Gallagher is a bigot. I, I, I think that people can come to this uh, in what I think of as a wrong-headed intellectual way, but I, it's still an intellectual way that... Uh, doesn't isn't necessarily motivated by animus of gays. Uh, I, I still think it's the case that a lot of people are against gay. A lot of people who are against gay marriage do come to it uh, through an animus of gays. And once the animus of gays goes away, um, there's not going to be enough people who have an intellectual commitment to this issue uh, for that side to win. Right, and I just think that well, and there's a downside to that too, right? I mean, uh, unfortunately, as it happens, we live in a country where fewer and fewer people have any sort of. Um, prior commitment or intellectual commitment to, to marriage, uh, to marriage norms at all, which I think is too bad. I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that, um, right. So in other words, for a lot of people, what's keeping them in this fight is a kind of, you know, uh, ickiness about, about gay men and lesbians. Uh, but right. it's not actually any, any commitment to marriage, which is what, which is what keeps Maggie Gallagher in this fight more than anything, I think. Um, right. now I think that's too bad. I actually, Maggie and I have a lot of common ground. I mean, you know, she and I, I think are both, um, very much, uh, pro-marriage. I, I think marriage is a, a good institution. I think it's one that our public policies um, and, and tax code and all sorts of things should incentivize. And, and in that, she and I agree. I think we should uh, think pretty deeply about you know how easy we want divorce to be. Um, I'm not saying to make it more difficult, but I think divorce is bad and it hurts children and it hurts the grown-ups who are involved. And so it, right. it's perfectly legitimate as a, as a policy question when thinking about the welfare of Americans, of our fellow citizens, to uh -huh. think about how do we encourage marriage um, and, and family stability. So, and, and not enough people do think about that. So I, you know, I'm not one of these people who says, well, let's just look at Sweden for, as a model for this, that, and the other thing. And I think there are too few married couples there. And so um, I, I do have this fantasy, and I felt this way when talking to David Blankenhorn as well, who, who talked to me for my article but didn't want to be quoted, uh -huh. um, that um, I think he and Maggie could both come around. <laughs> I think that uh, you know the evidence probably exists more so with David than with Maggie, but I think the evidence probably exists that could bring them around. Um, uh -huh. I do think that Maggie is fighting some psychic battles about her own past that would make it harder for her to come around. I mean, she she is married now and she has one child by her her husband. Um, although it hasn't been an easy marriage, they were separated for a couple years at one point. So um, you know, I think she. At one point, I say that you know because she saw such bad parenting from the man who got her pregnant with her elder son, she she wants to say that that gay men are the cause of poor parenting in others. Um, she, you right. know that's that's a, a nice a nifty scapegoat. But yeah, you know she could come around in theory. I mean, it, it, we could, she's convincible. So I don't I don't scorn her or sort of want to give up on her in this regard. Right. Yeah, and and I wonder. Um, it, it seems to me that. If you're someone who values uh, marriage as a norm, you're probably, in the end, going to be well served by gay marriage becoming legal. That, that's my um, that's my right. Guess. One would I'm, think, I, right? I mean, like all sorts of enthusiasm around marriage is probably uh, a step in the right direction, right? Right, and, and and I think the alternative, right? I mean, even when marriage hadn't yet happened in uh, in New York for gays and lesbians, I knew people who were you know, in their early 20s and uh, of a sort of activist bent and were saying, well, I'm not going to get married until gays are allowed to get married, right? right? Uh, and this wasn't a huge number of people, um, but but it was a thing. It, it was a, a politicization of marriage that uh, made people antagonistic toward the institution that w wouldn't have otherwise been antagonistic. 
And, and I think that there's this kind of wonderful feedback loop if you're a supporter of gay marriage where uh, as more and more gay couples get married, um, not only do people see that, you know, the sky doesn't fall, right. um, but there's also a reluctance to sort of take away uh, someone's marriage that seems different to people. Uh, to, to, to demarry people seems different than to not allow them uh, to get married in the first place. And, and I can't help but think that, uh, you know, as uh, it, there's no way that gays and lesbians are going to go back to their former level of invisibility in society. These are going to be characters on sitcoms, uh, and they're going to be people in your neighborhoods and in your children's schools. And, uh, you know, it, so, so long as that's the case, um, it, it seems that it would be a threat to traditional minded people if uh, there was this very visible population that was having loving relationships and that weren't getting married, and that that would uh, <laughs> that that would sort of create a yeah. norm that you didn't want created, and, right? Right, and I mean, and and the the other piece of this is that gay marriage is a huge problem for um, certain people who are very invested in in gay and queer culture. I mean, there's no question, but that this is the mainstreaming of gay people. Andrew Sullivan talks about you know, the, the de right, de yeah. death of gay culture, and I think. You know, to people like um, like Michael Warner, who were uh, invested in a in a certain idea that that queerness was um, you know an anti bourgeois uh, actor uh, or construct right. that it was challenging conventional norms that gay people couldn't want to be married or serve in the military things like that that they were a kind of natural outsider group maybe like like Jews uh, although you know I don't I don't know that Michael ever do that comparison but um, uh -huh. that uh, that this is a huge problem right that what this is yeah. part of the march of gay people toward um, toward gated communities in the suburbs and, and uh, you know, ga gas guzzling SUVs and stuff. And uh, it's, you know, it's not all going to be good. I mean, I think we, we actually need more, um, you know, Chelsea's and, and Greenwich Villages and, and fewer, um, you know, gated McMansion communities. But, but again, that just speaks to the, the weirdness that there are conservatives who would, who would oppose this. Right. How will Richard Florida know how to invest if... Uh, <laughs> That's right. When gays are not socially <laughs> or culturally distinguishable. Uh, right. We're, how will Richard Florida know? I mean, the, the other thing to, to think about there um, is that I do think this will... Re the feedback loop you're talking about really does be... will begin to um, impinge on the, the blue state, red state, red state, you know, and, and upper class, working class stratification, uh, which is to say that um, the more gay marriage arrives in certain blue states and the more that it mainstreams the, the gay men and lesbians and the more that it then excites uh, straight people back toward marriage, possibly, um, as, as a respectable institution that we, we are going to get married and just not cohabitate, one can see it really just creating whole communities in which the, there's a stronger marriage norm and gay and lesbian couples are welcome in it. And mm -hmm. it's going to be an upper class initially, an, uh, or at least culturally upper class, socioeconomically upper class community of people right. who are like this. And it's going to make uh, Mississippi seem even more distant from New York. So you've recently gone and profiled a, a bunch of different prominent Catholics. Uh, of <laughs> so it seems, right? I have this, a fetish for, for odd Catholics. Yeah, so tell me about this. I mean, you're, uh, uh, for those who don't know your work, you write a weekly column on religion and, and have done lots of wonderful magazine-length pieces uh, on the subject as well. So what interests you uh, in particular about people of the Catholic I, I can't put my finger on that at all. I mean, it, it, it just so happens there are some really interesting people who are doing some, some curious and interesting thinking who are, who are Roman Catholic. Uh, you know, so I've written about Ross Douthat for Mother Jones Magazine remains the only real profile of Ross Douthat, as far as I can tell. Um, I've written about Dan Savage, and actually I'm, I'm working on a longer piece that's going to be a, a, an e-book single about Dan Savage, who's, who's Catholic, grew up uh, in a Catholic family. Um, and, um, yeah, and Maggie Gallagher, and I've written about the Opus Dei school in Washington, where Maggie's son goes, as well as Rick Santorum's kids, even though he says he's a homeschooler, his kids actually go to the school when they get to high school. Um, mm -hmm. You know, an easy way to, another way to look at that might be that if you're looking for intellectually challenging people, um, it has been famously argued by evangelicals themselves that the evangelical uh, subculture is not producing a lot of great uh, intellectual thought. Um, this is Mark Knoll's argument in The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. And that's not to say there aren't smart evangelicals and plenty of intellectual evangelicals. It's that their own community doesn't tend to exalt them and support them and raise them up to right. places of power as much. So, um, uh -huh. whereas the, the Catholic subculture um, does.
So there isn't right now the evangelical version of, of Princeton's Robert George, for example. Right. Okay. And, and so, uh, so, so this is another kind of argument that's been uh, batted around in, uh, on the web lately. Who, who is it that speaks for Catholics? We had this controversy right. over birth control, which, of course, the Catholic Church is against, uh, but most Catholics famously uh, depart from the Church on this and, and use birth control and, uh, and say publicly that they're okay with birth control. Mm -hmm. uh, so... so so how do we how do we treat this? Who is uh, who is speaking for Catholicism? I guess right. I mean, I was I was going to write a piece, but then the Times, uh, my own newspaper, ran uh, in its um, opinionator section a piece uh, by a philosopher arguing that what I think is true, which is that it's it's erroneous to say the Catholic Church opposes birth control because what you're doing is privileging the teachings of the Catholic bishops and of, of the of the Pope uh, on the question of birth control. And there's there's no actual prior reason to say that what the hierarchy teaches is in fact what the Catholic Church teaches. It depends how you define the Catholic Church. If you define the Catholic Church as the, the corporate body of um, you know, hundreds of millions of Roman Catholics and what they believe and what they practice, then it might be just as accurate to say that, that the Catholic Church fully endorses um, artificial contraception. So uh, you know, another way to think about that is to, is to, is to look at other religions, right? I mean, there are all sorts of, of rabbis in Judaism who teach this, that, or the other thing, but there, but nobody says, it, it, it's much more complicated to say, well, Judaism teaches this. I mean, would we say Judaism teaches that you don't drive on the Sabbath? Well, you know, certain Orthodox movements have statements that you ought not to drive on the Sabbath, but, right. um, but everyone knows that at almost every Orthodox congregation, there's a parking lot that has cars in it on the Sabbath. And what's more, the conservative movement teaches that you're allowed to drive to get to synagogue, <laughs> but, but you should try to avoid it otherwise. And the reform movement says right. it's fine altogether. So Catholicism, it just so happens, there's like one-stop shopping, which is you can go to Barnes & Noble and you can pick up a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, published by Doubleday. And you can say, flip through it and say, what do they teach? But that doesn't mean that that teaching is any more authoritative than, than other teaching. I mean, you grew up Catholic, right? I did, it, which just adds evidence to your Catholic fetish here you are talking <laughs> on blogging heads and uh yeah you know i would say um i don't know i kind of think that the catholic church uh i, I kind of bind to the idea that the catholic church th that the hierarchy uh defines catholic teaching um you know i personally i come at this uh, i i in eighth grade uh my mother would have loved it had i gotten confirmed mm -hmm. and this was uh you know one of my uh, one of the biggest rebellions of my life of my young life uh, was not getting confirmed was saying uh, you know i don't believe these things actually and uh you know there were, there were lots of people in my uh in my class lots of my peers who took a different attitude toward it who thought of themselves as culturally catholic and who went on to get married in the church um and <laughs> totally don't believe uh a lot of what the catholic church teaches um, you know, to me, uh, I, I guess my thinking was, was one, I, you know, you're going to have me go through this ceremony where I'm actually supposed to affirm that I believe all these right. things. And I was sort of uncomfortable doing that when I didn't. Um, but also it seems as if, uh, as if there is a thing, if, if you're a Catholic, right, who doesn't believe all of these various things, then aren't you a Protestant? Like, are, are, aren't there aren't there religions for people like that uh, that, that in fact came about precisely for these reasons? And uh, and thought of it that way. You know, yeah, that's. I mean, that's a that's a nice, that's a good way to look at it, right? I mean, that, that in fact for for heretics as well as for believers, it's useful to think of the Catholic Church as something um, timeless um, and and pretty consistent across time. Is is that is that what you're saying? Well, and, you know, I mean, the, the thing is the Catholic Church, uh, you know, it, it does change on some things. Before Vatican II and after Vatican II, uh, you, you could say, wow, the Catholic Church is a very different organization or a very different religion than, than it was. Um, and, it, you know, the people didn't change overnight. Right. Uh, the people didn't change from before it was handed down to after it was handed down. Uh, in, in the same way, if the Catholic Church were to come out and say um, contraceptives are okay, um, this would be a huge world event, right? Right. With, with sweeping ramifications for, and, and it would affect people in different countries differently. Uh, but it would be a big deal. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think it's certainly worth noting that that Catholics uh, 
don't always share the beliefs of the church. And, and, you know, this is something that comes up with every religion that you write about, as you well right. know, that, that there are differences between uh, religion right. as it's practiced and religion as it's, as it's theoretically defined. Um, so, so I guess I want to make, uh, I don't, I don't want to make the strong claim that, that Catholicism is what the church says. I think I want to make um, a slightly weaker claim that at least what the church says is an important component uh, that, that we should pay attention to. Def no, definitely. I mean, I, I don't mean to write the, the actual teachings of the church uh, as taught by the people who are charged with, with doing the teachings uh, out of out of the church, right? That would be that yeah. would be a little silly. Uh, only that it's much more complicated than just, here's what the Catholic Church teaches. I mean, in, and in some pretty significant ways. So, for example, I know lots of Catholics right. who, when they've approached their priests and said, is it okay if we practice birth control? You know, we have four kids. We've had four kids in six years. We're feeling pretty under the gun. What should we do? Uh, it's very common to hear people say that their priest has told them, well, you should follow your conscience, you know? Right. Uh, so, you know, if priests are telling people that, I mean, I mean, sometimes I actually wonder, and I've certainly talked to a number of priests who do believe in the teaching, and I wrote about one uh, on, on, on Saturday in the, in the Times, Father Landry from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Um, right. And there are others. I spoke to two others in the course of reporting that. Um, of the five people I called, three of them um, were supportive of the church teaching. But um, but I sometimes you know, feel I'll, I'll talk to dozens of Catholic couples in a row who will say that their priest doesn't support the teaching. And so, um, yeah. you know, then you start wondering, well, is it just is it just the bishops? And, and not even the bishops. I mean, is it really the Pope? And then he selects for bishops who who happen to agree with him on this. It's just very unclear. And, yeah. um, and, the, and the, even the hierarchy doesn't speak of one voice. And from 1965 to 1968, the Vatican was, was quote, studying the issue. And then when Humanae uh -huh. Vitae came out in 68, that settled the issue. But there were three years during which most Catholics thought that the church was about to reverse its position. And the priests who came into the, the priesthood during that time or who um, stayed in the priesthood during that time rather than, than leaving and, you know, being disaffected, um, right. they were they believed that the church was about to, to reverse it. So the church actually is permeated with these people, these 60s era priests, many of them left, but, but a lot stayed, who, who really joined a church that they thought wasn't uh, anti-contraception. So right, yeah. just that as journalists, I, I think that I, I'm trying to say things like the Catholic, hierarchy, the Catholic hierarchy teaches thus and such rather than Catholicism teaches such and such. Yeah, I, I would be, I'd be fascinated actually to go and look at the way that journalists treat these sorts of issues with religion and compare it to the way that they that they define uh, political parties, right. that they define countries, right? Like, how do we, what language do we use to talk about the United States? This is the position of the United States government. This is the position right. of the American people. Um, and, and I wonder if it's consistent because there is, um, I, I, I haven't thought this through enough to, to really know my, but it seems like at least some people would have the intuition that religion is is different maybe i don't know um but, but i wonder if it's treated this well I, I mean that's actually an interesting comparison right because everyone knows that the, that the political party platforms in the united states are meaningless right they, they right. actually matter in parliamentary systems because when you when you win you have a majority in the in the parliament and then you can actually uh -huh. enact this platform you you were running on but what's in the right. republican party or democratic party platform is completely meaningless uh when it comes to what the president or the congress will do um so i, I actually think there's an interesting um you know, comparison there uh, to to religion, um, but so uh, well. So now, now that we've strayed into uh, journalism <laughs> and what journalists should do, let's talk about. Uh, there was a woman. I'm forgetting her name, but she's the new bureau chief for right, Jody New York Times yeah. in Jerusalem. Yeah, and uh, there's been uh, controversy about things that she has tweeted. Another Twitter controversy, right. and I guess. Tell me, I, I'm I'm forgetting. I read about it. But well, the first thing me, the first thing I should say, exactly? yeah, the first thing I should say is that even though I do write a biweekly religion column for the Times and write for the magazine occasionally, and and I'm not a staffer. I'm a freelance contributor. I don't work in the office. When I when I get to the building, I have to have someone you know come down the elevators and let me in. I have no status there, and I've never actually met uh, Jody Rejoin, who's the new. Uh, Middle East or Jerusalem bureau chief. Um, I learned that she was the new chief only when I was reading about it on media blogs. Uh, if there was an internal memo, I didn't get it. So, um, you know, she and I have emailed maybe a dozen times over the years about this, that, or the other thing. So um, I have no dog in this hunt. She was, right after being selected for the job, she tweeted a couple things that I think got her in trouble. One was she tweeted some praise 
of Peter Beinart's forthcoming book. Peter Beinart, who used to edit The New Republic, as you know, right. and has become something of a skeptic of the traditional Zionist line that he used to push. Uh, she also used an Arabic word for thank you, I think, in signing off some of her tweets. And that was seen as signaling, you know, too much sympathy with Arabs. <laughs> and then um, Mark Tracy, who's a very fine blogger for the, the web magazine Tablet, uh, tabletmag.com. Um, Mark wrote, a, this was just one thing I saw where he said, you know, this is already embroiling her in things she doesn't have to be embroiled in. You know, as a reporter, um, she just shouldn't be tweeting on this stuff. It serves no, it serves no good. It's only going to make people dubious of her motives. And even though she might be a very fine reporter, she should lay off these tweets and, and, and pretend to objectivity uh, or strive for right. objectivity. And I just thought that, um, you know, that, that struck me as just exactly the wrong way to look at it. Right. Um, yeah, you know, I have a strong, uh, I have a strong opinion in this, not, not in this particular case, right. but on the general matter of, of journalists and whether they should, uh, remain quote unquote objective right. in, in, in what they put up publicly. I just think that this is, um, this is this is absurd that that uh, that journalism that journalism as a whole that newspapers like the Times and the Washington Post um, by buying into this idea that every reporter that they have should uh, refrain from expressing public opinion on anything uh, they've made it too easy to go and discredit these reporters when they inevitably <laughs> say something that seems to show that they have some bias or other um, as if that discredits right them because I, I mean I think that. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm held to the Times ethics policy now because I'm a regular, I'm on a freelance contract, and it says we're not supposed to give money to political campaigns, but I have a whole history of giving money to political campaigns that predates my right. writing for the Times, and, and a lot of people do. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not supposed to sign petitions or give money anymore, but, you know, I'm 37 years old, and I've only been doing this for two years, and I had a long history before that of giving money and signing petitions, and, you know, anyone from Fox News could could discover that I'm, you know, uh, if not uh, the flaming liberal that they want me to be uh, at, you know, at Fox News, I'm, I'm exactly the kind of liberal they think people's uh, the New York Times. So wh why would I, yeah, I agree, I, I never thought of that, right, that you're actually giving fodder to the people who just want to go around making reporters out to be liars. Right, and this fodder is just, um, it's, it's death now, right? There was a time when you could sort of maintain this illusion that, uh, that reporters operating in an objective capacity really were just sort of, uh, I, I guess, blank slates, uh, uh, like uh, uh, who were sort of taking the world in and then and then giving it back without filtering it through any of their own uh, biases. Right. But that's just no longer true. I mean, first of all, um, just about every journalist who's going to come up now is going to have a history of tweets and you know things they wrote that are online for their college newspaper and a Facebook page with a collection of friends mm -hmm. that you can identify uh, who their friends right. are. And uh, th there's just too much information out there about people to maintain the illusion that uh, that we can't sort of tell where they're coming from. And, and then it becomes almost like a conspiracy. It's like, well, everybody knows that this person uh, has these characteristics. Are you really going to tell me that, that they're objective? Right. And, and, uh, now I can and, see and, I can see a, a version of the of the argument opposite where you say okay, fair enough, but but don't give money to particular campaigns because if you ever have to write about anything that, that touches on the campaign, um, you'll you'll have uh, a sympathy there. Like if if you've given a lot of money, let's say you've given the maximum legal limit to uh, mm -hmm. Ron Paul for president, and then you're writing something that touches on Ron Paul, well, you've already voted with your money, with your pocketbook, you want him to win, it, you know, it, it may skew your objectivity even more that you've sunk the money in, um, or that you volunteer time, that you phone bank for him. I can see that argument. I actually can, can see an argument that says, uh, don't entangle yourself with particular causes, because who knows when you'll be called on to cover them, or um, that, that you'd just be prudent about those kinds of entanglements. Um, I can see, I, I could buy into a version of that, but the idea that you're not supposed to, you know, put up anything on Facebook or tweet anything or whatever that that might betray that you have opinions. I, I agree with you. That's just it's it's a dead letter at this point. Well, and also, I mean, part of what perplexes me about the hard line that um, some newspapers and that that NPR takes on this sort of thing is that we have this whole model of journalism uh, where these norms don't prevail, right? The whole magazine world right. is a place where people right. have all sorts of different idiosyncratic opinions and they still write about all sorts of things. 
And right, the, you know, the New Yorker it, has always had front of the book editorials or notes and comments that have been left wing. Going back to E. B. White writing about his support for the United Nations in the late forties, early fifties. Uh, and through right. Rick Hertzberg, David Remnick. I mean, even, you know, people don't think of it as a political magazine like Slate or The New Republic or Weekly Standard, but but it always has been, in fact. Right. And so, for example, if you followed David Remnick's career for a long time, you know all sorts of things about where he's coming right. from as a person, where he's coming from as a journalist. And so, you know, he wrote a book about President Obama. Right. When I see him write something in uh, the talk of the town about President Obama, uh, my thought isn't, Oh, well, this David Remnick, he's clearly biased, uh, you know. No, I, I understand where he's coming from, and, and does that affect how I read him? Well, sure, I know uh, that I, I don't read him in the same way that I would read, you know, Rich Lowry of National Review right. writing a comment of the same length about Obama. It's not to say that I don't take uh, both of them seriously, um, but, but I, feel, uh, I feel better about knowing where they're coming from. Uh, and, and I think more and more people are sophisticated enough readers uh, – to, to do this. And, and I also think that some of the most trusted names on different topics are magazine folks who have strong opinions mm -hmm. about them, and, and we nevertheless trust them because of their reputation and because of the quality of their work. And I think magazine editors are in a position of strength vis-a-vis -vis newspapers because they can say, look, uh, we lay our cards on the table. Here's the article. Uh, depending on the magazine, we fact-checked it, and uh, we, we certainly stand behind it. And if you have a problem with it, Okay, well, what's your problem? Well, I think that's right, but I, I think there are two things going on here that have to be have to be separated. Um, uh -huh. One is that uh, there's the philosophical thing, which is some people at institutions like the New York Times, CBS News, NPR, the sort of the the, the good gray ladies, um, the blue chips, uh, believe that they should be unbiased and shouldn't betray bias, and that that reporters can rid themselves of that bias, or at least owe it to their audience to. Um, betray no hint of bias, right? That there's a philosophical reason that has to do with the foundations of journalism in a free society. That's number one. Number two, and I have no evidence for this, but I think that there are people in these institutions, again, there could be, it strikes me there are people who may be thinking this way unconsciously, who think that's our market brand. That's, our brand is objectivity. And that people who want conservatism can go to Fox News. Uh, people who want something on the far left could, could you know, could read The Nation or whatever. Um, and that there are newspapers, you know, the, the, the one in New Hampshire that always kind of sets down the right-wing party line. Is it the union leader in Manchester whose endorsement everyone always wants? There are newspapers that also are real party apparatuses. But, but, but The Times or CBS News or NPR, we, we exist to serve that customer who wants objectivity. And therefore, if we betray that too much, they actually then, then how are we any more useful to them? Uh, why, were, why would our advertisers advertise in our pages? But I think that's false. I actually think that most people who read um, uh, the leading newspapers, let's use the Wall Street Journal since it's one I don't write for anymore. Um, they're reading because I think it's very good at what it does. And there are lots of liberals who have a perception that who know that the editorial page of the journal is conservative, but it, you know the journal's a really good paper, so they they keep getting it. And, um, you know, and that's okay with everyone. Uh, so I just don't think there's this market niche out there for people who are buying something because they think this is the objective thing. So I think that one thing this does, right, this idea that, uh, that there's room for opinion journalism, but that the news people should be, you know, objective and fair-minded and that this is important to democracy, right? Right. Uh, I think this actually lets opinion journalists off the hook in a way that, that, at these places, they're actually held to an insufficiently high standard, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're if you're writing opinion content, right, you should still uh, you should still be fair minded. Uh, you should still it isn't just carte blanche to <laughs> to sort of write whatever right. you want, or it shouldn't be. And, and I would argue that you see some opinion journalists take this to heart, and uh, and you know, I mean, if you're uh, when I read your stories about uh, Dan Savage, say. Um, you agree with Dan Savage on various things. You disagree with him on various things. You're not hiding that fact, but you're giving us a sympathetic portrayal of this guy and his ideas. Uh, and, and by sympathetic, what I don't mean that you're not being tough on him or you're not being tough on Mally Gallagher or whatever. I just mean that you're trying to say, okay, what, what, are, what are these person's ideas and how can I faithfully convey them uh, to the reader in, in their strongest form right. uh, so, th so that they can be judged? And to me, that's the sort of standard that you want to hold up. Uh, and, you know, do we want to call that objective or do we want to call it 
something else, like, do we call it fair? Yeah, what I mean, the idea, the idea is that you're, if you're writing about somebody, that that person should recognize him or herself in what you've written, that that, right. that they would say, yeah, that, that sounds like me. And, you know, this comes from, my, in my case, it comes from my old high school debate training, where, it, you know, the, the I always felt like, and my coach always felt like the highest form of debate was the one where you like were overly indulgent of your opponent's arguments and you gave them all the credit in right. the world, you gave them every benefit of the doubt and, and you said all that and, and then you summed up by saying, however, even conceding all of that, I still think they're wrong. Um, right. you know, it wasn't the one where you cut off all their premises at the knees and then like, you know, kicked them over like, you know, the stumpy Monty Python character. I mean, it was so, right. um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it seems to me the war has to be won against, um, against uh, cynicism and, and cruelty in writing about people um, and in favor of, you know, fair-mindedness and, and, you know, sympathy is, I think, a good word and sort of fellow feeling. And that, it seems to me that, gives, that puts you in a place where you get even more credit when you, um, when you take someone down. Uh, I mean, like in your writing, for example, I mean, I know that, I mean, theoretically, you, I seem to recall you identified as a conservative when I was teaching you. Um, and... It's hard for me, and I'm not saying that you come across as a liberal now, but I don't feel that I'm reading this conservative guy when I read your stuff. I feel like I'm reading a really opinionated guy, but it always seems to me like you're trying really hard to, um, to really write about the subject at hand rather than from the place of your own political beliefs. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I didn't identify as a conservative at NYU, although uh, I probably uh, I probably seemed that way relative to other NYU students. Yeah, maybe I made that up. To, I mean, maybe you didn't. Yeah, and I compared maybe, to how I seem on the internet. <laughs> maybe I identified um, you that way. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I think uh, if you did, you wouldn't have been the only one to do uh -huh. so. Uh, and it, it's certainly true that. Uh, I mean, it's a combination of things, really. One is that I was certainly to the right of right. the vast majority of my classmates at NYU. Ma Master students at NYU, right. Right. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I was also, uh, I think because I was to the right of most of my fellow students at NYU, I felt like uh, it, it was in some way my, uh, my obligation to speak up uh, and sort of play devil's advocate. Right. Uh, on a lot of things when I heard sort of what I regarded to be sort of weak arguments being bandied about. Right. I was like, well, I guess I'm the only one that's ever going to raise an objection to uh, to this. Uh, so so I might as well do it and have out the conversation. Um, and, it, you know, I think, uh, I, I mean, I think really I would have identified uh, as uh, as a libertarian mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if I had to be boxed into identifying as something. Right. And um, I, I think that one thing I struggle with, I, I, I'm glad that, that my writing comes across that way to you now, that I'm opinionated yet wrestling with trying to, trying to be fair. Uh, it, I, f I followed this thing with, uh, Jonathan Chait wrote this column the other day uh, where he was responding to people asking him, why are you so, why are you so angry right. and hateful, basically? And, uh, and his response was, well, uh, I feel the need sometimes to... Uh, to write in such a way that signals that the person that I am uh, engaging with should not be taken seriously. Right. Uh, I, I think he would he would say that there are people out there in uh, in politics and public discourse who are not uh, who who are not being intellectually honest, who are not engaged in uh, the spirit of uh, of like, discourse uh, like, that we like should really not. true true inquiry or actually curious about right. something. Right. Yeah, and, and I think, uh, uh, and, and I don't want to say anything about the particular person that he was saying this about. Uh, I guess I don't know that I agree with him, or that I agree with. Uh, I don't know that I agree with him in the argument that he was having. But so I think it's useful to sort of separate it and, and just take his argument in general. Right. Like, is this ever true? Um, and to me, I try to I try to go a long way toward uh, giving people the benefit of the doubt, um, even people who. Uh, have uh, you know attacked me in a way that I regard to be unfair on, on Twitter or something like this? Um, I will still try and in, engage their ideas right. in a way that is uh, you know fair to them. I, I must say I do have a limit, and, and that limit is uh, people who have um, people who I do think are being disingenuous, and I, I have done enough due diligence to be very confident in this judgment. And I, there are very few people I put in this category. Um, you know, Rush Limbaugh, for example. Right. I was going to say, do you want to name a couple of the category. ones who end up in the, yeah. <laughs> in the category? And, 
and, and, and you know, I, I say this because he's someone who, uh, on dozens and dozens of occasions, I've done the homework and gone and looked at things he said and sort of fact-checked them and found them to be false. Uh, I think that, um, you, you know, I've seen him sort of contradict himself in very direct ways for which, uh, you know, spend enough time on the air, everyone's going to contradict himself sometimes. But these were like particularly egregious examples, right? right? And it's not to say that if Rush Limbaugh makes an argument for, for anything, I'm just going to dismiss it or heap scorn on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, he still offers arguments that are perfectly legitimate arguments, and I think that they should be treated uh, seriously because uh, because we're being fair to ideas and uh, other people who have these ideas, right. not just the person right. speaking for them. At the same time, I do think that there is something to be said for... Um, for arguing that, uh, I think if we were to, if I were to treat Rush Limbaugh right in the same way that I treat, um, you know, I'm trying to think of someone who I, I disagree with deeply but but respect, right. who is sort of occupies a lot of the same positions. Um, you know, I'm inclined to treat Victor Davis Hanson, uh -huh. who probably agrees with Rush Limbaugh on a lot of right. things, uh, much more seriously than I'm going to treat Rush Limbaugh. Uh, because for, for all my disagreements with him, I think that he is earnestly uh, making arguments that he believes to be true. And uh, well, that's one. I, I mean, I'm having... That's one way to slice it, right? I mean, another, and, and this I might be just rephrasing what you're saying here, but another another thing to think about is: Are there people um, who um, who are need to be taken down because? They really, it, so you're saying certain people just are such enemies of the truth that, that they need to be treated as um, as a little bit silly or, or with a little bit of contempt. Well, I, uh, or maybe, maybe that's not quite what you're saying. I, I'm, I would say there are certain people who are so obviously enemies of the good <laughs> uh, uh -huh. that um, in a kind of objective way. I mean, so here's one thing I'm thinking about. Um, you know, Christopher Hitchens once wrote a piece, still one of my favorite pieces ever, for Harper's Magazine about Norman Pedoras. Um, uh -huh. in which he reviewed his book, uh, put Horace's book, Ex Friends. And, um, you know, the, the review was really, really, really scathing. Um, but I was persuaded, although I should say I never ended up reading the book, but I was, I was persuaded knowing what I knew of, of put Horace and some, and, and the things in particular, the way he treats, um, the people who disagree with him. Um, uh -huh. I was persuaded by Hitchens that this was actually a guy who, um, needed to be treated with a certain degree of contempt in order to be, to be true to oneself, that for Hitchens to be true to himself, he couldn't just um, review it like any other book. That that would be dishonest with the reader, in fact. Um, right. And I think that that kind of thing, uh, that kind of position um, exists. You know, I don't regret that Hitchens, for example, took on Kissinger and Mother Teresa in the ways that he did. I think that <laughs> they merited the treatment they got. And um, no, But I don't feel that way about everyone that Hitchens did that to. So, you know, right. I, I, just, I guess I think there are certain, there are exceptions to the rule you're making. Yeah, I guess the way that I would put it is, um, so, so I think that the way that I think you and I would both like debate and discourse to work, um, it, it, it involves a certain amount of charitability, right? Uh, and, and granting that charitability is usually a very good thing, uh, but uh, people can take advantage of that charitability. Right. And if you let them take advantage of it without calling them out on the fact that they're doing so, you undermine uh, you undermine the environment that you need to have a thriving discourse generally. You can't let uh, you can't let people take advantage of you uh, or take advantage of sort of the spirit well, of charitable. It's funny you it's funny you put it that way. That kind of, sorry for interrupting. Uh, uh, that that, that no, you know, go, there are certain people who they'll take advantage of your spirit of charitability in a way that actually makes everyone worse off. Um, there is there's a yes. person I once uh, wrote something about. That um, it wasn't factually inaccurate, but it was um, it was it was it was it was unfair the way and 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 I didn't give uh, this person proper room to respond within the, the scope of my piece to um, to the characterization. Right. And I've always wanted to apologize. Um, the thing is, this person is um, is uh, so has been so dishonest in writing uh, about me in other in other venues in other ways. Uh, uh -huh. I mean, right down to sort of paranoid conspiracy theories. Um, it's hard for it's always been hard for me to imagine how would I um, phrase an apology in such a way that made it clear 
that although I am truly sorry that I wrote about this person in an unfair way, that this this person then went completely ballistic in a way that's totally destructive to the journalistic process and to and to civil discourse, and that uh, that, that that was way worse, in fact, than what I had done. There's just no right. way to, to there was no way to construct that. Um, yeah. Well, so and, and and I guess what I've settled on, and and I don't know that that this is always how I'll feel, but. Uh, what I try to do, you know, if you read stuff that I've uh, written on the internet about uh, Rush Limbaugh or Mark Levin, uh-huh. another talk radio host that I've tangled with, uh, what, what I've tried to do is say, I, I don't think that these people are operating honestly, and, and so I'm not being charitable to them in that sense. Uh, and, and these are the reasons why I, I don't think that. Uh, at, at the same time, um, the, the particular things that I'm arguing against, I try to treat those arguments as as if someone else were making them and try to really take on the substance and go point by point and say, no, this is wrong because this, this is wrong because that. Um, and, and I hope that there's a way to do that where, where uh, you're sort of being charitable and uncharitable at the same time, not being taken advantage of, but at the same time uh, doing the argument justice. And I suppose people can judge whether I've succeeded at that or not better than I can. Yeah, I think uh, you have. I, mean, I think, but, I think uh, the Mark Levin stuff uh, in particular is is quite good. I mean, well, I suppose another thing, another kind of question to pose is, are these people, you know, if you have a fairly uh, big platform and they have a fairly big platform and you guys in a certain sense are peers, right? You're not just some, some schmo walking off the street wanting to tangle with them. Um, will they do the courtesy of actually arguing this stuff? And I think that one of the things that, that upsets Jonathan Chait, whom I admire a lot, about some of the stuff, for example, that, that I think Stephen Moore writes, I think that's one of the people he tangles with a lot. Um, or uh, Veronique Danaghi or you know, some of these others, I think he feels like he poses these really, really valid criticisms and then they completely ignore them. And that, and I, I share his frustration sometimes when I, again, I don't remember any particular posts at all, but um, that here's someone who really does know a lot about this stuff and also has a sizable audience and is engaging with them as fellow public intellectuals. And then they just write around it right. in a way that as if he didn't say anything. And he, I think it's okay for him to be really angry about that. Yeah. Well, and I would be curious to, um, I, I guess I would be curious to see you profile someone uh, who you had less high regard for than a <laughs> Ross Douthat or a Maggie Gallagher and, and to see right. how you handled it, right? Because uh, w- one thing that I've done, uh, b- because I have an interest in uh, the conservative movement and conservatism generally and, and the right as a whole and its politics and because I think that uh, talk radio is sort of a, a, a pathological thing that is hurting this movement that, uh, you know, I, I th- that is in some ways, you know, in some ways the right is a better vehicle for a lot of my ideas mm-hmm. than, than the left. And I would like to see it uh, improve in certain ways so that uh, I would feel good about supporting at least some candidates who are coming from a, a sort of uh, libertarian Republican. Uh, and and so I, I think it is necessary to sort of my larger uh, project as a writer to argue with people right. like Limbaugh and Levin because they are, you know, prominent voices, best-selling authors, very highly rated talk radio hosts, and they're having a, uh, a big influence on debate. I think some people uh, who are frustrated by how often I argue with them would say, why are you taking time and, and granting these people, uh, you know, why are you taking right. these people seriously? Uh, well, that's interesting because I think I think that in a similar way, and I'm someone who's you know I'm I'm, a, I'm more to the left, uh, I suppose I'm left of center, though not particularly far left, generally speaking. But you know that one of the ways I think I try to reform some of the what I see as the crazy voices on the left is by modeling how to be civil toward the right, if that makes any sense. So. Right. Um, that one, like you know, you're saying one way to cleanse the right is to really engage with some of the people who are polluting it. And I think I'm, I have a different, a sl- I sometimes feel a slightly different project, which is in order to um, really make the, 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 the marriage rights movement the best movement it can be, let's um, show how it's possible to look at Meg Gallagher, who you know, in a sense, is the enemy, but do it without attacking her weight or insinuating things about her son, or all the things that you'll find um, among some of the real ideologues on the left. Because I think that if they could talk about her more the way I talk about her, they they advance their cause. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Well, so let's uh, let's end by talking about homeschool, which is another thing (laughs) that has been in the news uh, news lately. Uh, Dana Goldstein uh, just published a piece at Slate 
uh, where she basically argued that you cannot be a good progressive and homeschool your kid. And her, um, I guess to just sketch her argument, one component of it was that there is what she called a peer effect, where if you're in class with, there's new evidence, maybe compelling, maybe not, I don't know, I haven't looked at it, but she would argue that um, there's this effect where if you're a lower income kid with parents, maybe you know a working parent who didn't graduate from high school, him or herself, and you're in class with uh, people from a more, uh, you know, from a higher income group with parents who are more educated, uh, that you're going to benefit from being in proximity mm -hmm. uh, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And this is going to sort of raise your academic performance right. as measured by test scores right. without hurting theirs. Uh, she also wants to argue that there is something sort of pernicious about people opting out of these big public institutions right. that we should all have a stake in. Uh, and so she basically says, you know, if, uh, if you're a progressive, you should be sending your kids to public school. You shouldn't be homeschooling. Uh, and she sort of, uh, I think she has this opinion both about conservative homeschoolers and liberal mm -hmm. homeschoolers, but she sort of directs her argument mostly at uh, at the liberals. Right. Well, what did you think of it? I, I very strongly disagree. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I have I have this Hayekian idea that it's good for society to have uh, different subcultures that are very yeah. different from the norm, yeah. right? That that we have this big public education system and we're always going to have it and we should fund it well and it should be the best system that we can have and as long as we're doing as good a job as we should be doing and that I want to be doing, you know, a, a big majority of people are going to uh, are going to put their kids through it because it's going to be free and hopefully it's going to be uh, relatively good. Um, but but at, the, at the same time, right, uh, you're, some of the features we see now in our public school system, right, uh, we see a regime of test scores that it is, uh, I, I would argue, very likely that is pernicious in some mm -hmm. ways, that people are teaching to the test in ways that, that is an ideal. We see that California and Texas, by virtue of their size, have these outsized influence in what textbook textbooks, maker, right. textbooks makers put in their textbook, and it seems to me that that isn't necessarily a good thing. So I think it's very useful to have sort of counterbalances to this power, and it's very useful to have like lots of different models all over well, the place. Well, let me that, say, first of all, that people are trying. Let, me, let me say a couple things. First of all, um, yeah. for once, I speak with some authority, uh, unlike, uh -huh. unlike when I write about Catholics, uh, not being Catholic, <laughs> uh, which is to say that I, the eldest of my three daughters, Rebecca, is a, is a, kinder, is a kindergartner this year. She attends okay. the very diverse... Um, uh, public school down the street from us, which may be half white, but I think is slightly less than half white. Um, wow. Maybe it's forty percent white. Um, and uh, she's a kindergartner in public school. I should also say that I did a mix of public and private schooling growing up. Um, okay. But uh, I spent a number of years in each. And um, and I'll also say that I, you know, my wife and I have said from time to time that if Rebecca is really miserable and in public school, uh, we would try to find a way to homeschool her. I think we don't feel that we could spend the money to private school her. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm open to all of the things that are being said on both sides of this. And yeah. uh, I, um, and I too, it, it, I like the way you said that you value subcultures. I mean, one of the things I often try to tell people about religion, even if they're total secularists, is I say, I'll say, but isn't it cool that we live in a country that has all of the, these crazy, crazy yeah. subcultures, right? Like, doesn't it make life richer? Uh, and don't we want to preserve that? Isn't that, isn't that somehow you know, what makes America great. Um, so yeah, yeah I don't want to, like, I, I oppose the early 20th century laws of compulsory public education directed at trying to force Catholics to send their kids to school where they got uh, the Protestant Bible read to them. You know, I think people want to yeah. homeschool, that's fine. Um, I, uh, uh, I think I have a different objection. I worry, I have a different objection than Dana Goldstein, or so, shall I say I have a more a uh, particular one. Um, yeah. I think a lot of the homeschoolers I see homeschooling seem to be doing a really lousy job. <laughs> I, right. I think that they um, uh, they don't take curriculum seriously. A lot of them buy these terrible online curricula, often very free with ideological content. Um, I think that the ones using conservative curricula are often giving their kids a very warped um, history and otherwise, perhaps warped science, uh, God forbid. And I think the ones who come at it from a kind of far left um, unschooling perspective, and that's an actual movement within homeschooling, unschooling, right. uh, often the kids don't learn anything. Um, if you don't believe me, go watch the movie Surfwise, where you see the Pasquins family would raise their kids to be surfers, but then when some of them wanted to go to college, like they didn't know anything. So, um, you know, I uh, and I also think that 
kids from good families uh, who have a lot of advantages probably do pretty fine in most public schools and don't come out of it much the worse. So it's sort of more a prudential thing for me that I just think that like I most of the parents I see who avoid the public schools, at least in New Haven, uh, which you know is not famous for its great public schools, but you know I think most parents who avoid avoid the public schools um, aren't. Uh, they, they might as well send their kids to the public schools, is what I'm saying. Um, so I have right. a just kind of general prudential opposition to most of homeschooling that I see um, going on. It doesn't rise to the philosophical level for me that it does with, with Dana Goldstein. Right, yeah. Yeah, I think, well, I, I guess one one uh, one objection that I have to, uh, to the way the real hardliners that are against homeschooling look at this is that, I, I mean, I certainly can see that there are homeschoolers out there who do uh, a terrible job mm -hmm. of, of educating their kids. Right. Um, it, it, it seems to me that uh, the homeschooling movement is always judged by the worst of its yep. Uh, yep. the worst of its parents, yep. right? And the public school system is is not judged by the worst of its schools, right? Um, I, I think that um, you know I think everyone who uh, has attended any sort of school with uh, <laughs> with even thirty kids in their class. Uh, can, can look back and think of the kids who are thriving and they can think of the kids who are struggling. Right. Uh -huh. And it, it, to me, no matter how much money you pour into the public education system, no matter how uh, skilled you are implementing uh, the right technocratic reforms, you're never going to build a system that is uh, best for everyone. It's just impossible to do. And, and you do the best that you can, uh, but you're always going to fall short. And to me, there are just going to be some kids who are going to thrive in a school where, uh, you know, there are some kids that are going to thrive in an all-girls school. There are some kids that are going to thrive in a home school. There are some kids that are going to thrive in a Catholic school. Um, and I think that parents are often going to make very imperfect decisions about where their kid is best going to thrive. Uh, and yet they're better equipped to make these decisions than anyone else. I mean, um, but do you really believe that, like that they're better equipped? I mean, I, I know that's the, I, do, I know yeah. that's the, uh, you know, certainly that's, that's the religious liberty pos position, you know, when Stephen Carter was my teacher, he was saying, well, don't parents know better than the government? But there are a lot of really stupid parents out there. I mean, there are a lot of parents who make terrible decisions for their kids' education. And, um, you know, s sending your kid to public school, I don't think in most cases is as terrible as the worst of homeschooling. Well, um, hmm. maybe, I don't know. Uh, but like con conceding that point, I, I just think I'm, I'm just, it's a, it's a thought experiment for me, right? I'm not saying, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying the government knows is best. I'm just saying like, I mean, there's a lot of hideous parents out there than whom the government does know better. Yeah. I just think that, that there are a lot of hideous parents, but but the easiest thing to do, right, is to send your kids to uh, public school. Yeah. And, and it seems to me that if you're going to go through the pretty significant burden of homeschooling your kids, um, you're probably not going to be one of the most hideous parents, right? I mean, to me, the most hideous parents are going to be the ones uh, who don't really care one way or another about right. their kids. Uh, and certainly aren't going to actively invest in their well, education. Well, let me let me let me um, put it differently. Let me say that there yeah. are. I mean, let look. The government knows better about immunizing kids than a, than a lot of parents do. Um, yeah, certainly. and uh, that's that's an easy right or wrong kind of thing. I realize, but a lot of so looking at the worst of homeschooling on the left, um, you okay. know, a lot of the community that Dana Goldstein may be writing about um, are these, you know, unbelievably smug, you know, uh, you know, anti-immunization. You know, they think that gluten-free is the answer to ADHD, uh, <laughs> unschooling right. um, wingnuts who are right. then going to, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll unschool or homeschool their kids with love, but do I believe they're raising their kids to be as much a part of what I do believe is a valuable common civic culture as the parents who send their kids to the local public school? Often not. Now, I'm not saying that implies right. any particular policy or legislative attendance, but in terms of moral suasion, which is what Dana Goldstein is trying to argue, I do think she has something very fairly real in her gun sights. Yeah, but I think that, it, I mean, it seems to me that if you're someone with her beliefs, some of which I grant are correct, it seems like there are different ways to respond to this, right? One way is to say, uh, there are these problems with homeschools, everyone should put their kids in public schools, and others to say there are these problems with homeschools, uh, you know, there are these good reasons to have them too, whether the Hayekian reasons I mentioned or other reasons. Uh, we need to pay more attention to, uh, you know, providing curriculum or making arguments uh, to people who are homeschooling about 
the flaws in their system or, or like, um, you, you know, in other words, why does there being problems with homeschooling imply that we should just uh, send all those kids to public school? Why shouldn't we improve the homeschool? Well, I mean, but let's look at let's look at the the positive case she makes for public schools, although she doesn't make it at wow. great length. I mean, I do see something incredibly noble about the the largely twentieth century experiment in compulsory education through public schools. I mean that, you know, my my wife who who went to Stives in high school in New York City and whose father and grandfather also went there and were educated there. I mean, that, like that's, that's in some ways like one of the noblest places in the world. I mean, here there's this city with this extraordinary melting pot and they take the children, the, the impoverished children of immigrants um, who were mm -hmm. in, in great measure a lot of my wife's classmates and give them like the best education imaginable at, at, at an incredibly rigorous place. And um, yeah, like why isn't it nobler to opt into that? Well, well I mean, for, for one thing, I think that um, I, I think it's a mistake to look at the the New York City school of a certain era and and conflate it with public education. I mean, when we're talking about um, when we're talking about the homeschooling movement and comparing it to the public education of old, right? We're actually comparing it to a system for much of American history, right? That wasn't actually offering. Uh, much in the way of the kind of diversity that we're talking about. I mean, it, it isn't as if most public schools 50 years ago were uh, operating in melting pot neighborhoods. In no, Brooklyn. no, no, but just like uh, the community building that, that results from having, from seeing your neighbors as fellow parents of, of, of school-aged children, which is something I feel very powerfully in my neighborhood. In New Haven. Right, yeah. Like that's, now, now, so, yeah. you know, that's an, an extraordinary point of contact with people who may not be people you'd otherwise socialize with because they have different politics or they're in different lines of work or they have different sensibilities. But when you're worried yeah. that, you know, such and such a teacher's uh, newest assistant teacher isn't up to snuff, that's something that, you know, it's just one of these things that brings you together. Right, yeah. So what I'd love actually, uh, what I'd love someone like Dana Goldstein to confront, right, is the idea that there's a tension between wanting to have these community institutions where people that live in the same locale are interacting with one another, uh, interacting with their neighbors, right? Um, and the idea that there should be lots of federal standards about curricula and what you can and can't do in public schools, because it seems to me that one reason why people go to private schools and why they go to, uh, and why they homeschool is that there isn't the same freedom as there was in uh, at different times in American history to influence their public schools to uh, reflect their values. Maybe, right? maybe, but I have to interject there and pose the question I pose to every uh, conservative or kind of school-minded, uh, you know, libertarian-minded school reformer, which is right, yeah. why is it that why does no one on your side care about the fact that all of the countries that crush us in educating their children have completely nationalized cookie-cutter curricula? Like why this why this fixation on localism when that in no case is what is shown to work? Um, well, I mean, I, first I would say that uh, you know we're a very successful country and localism has worked for us, but, right? But it's, not in education. I mean, it, it's a you. I mean, you could say, of course, certain localisms have, but there's the evidence overwhelmingly, if you look at it, compare countries, is that localism is bad for education. Well, me measured how? By, like, math test scores? Um, sure. By math test scores, by knowledge of one's own culture, you know, but uh, of, of one's own I, national I, I history. Mean, I mean, these things are measured in eight gazillion ways, but nowhere does it seem to come out that if you let local school boards decide things that they end up, on average, doing a better job than... I, I, I mean, I, I, I guess I have two responses. One, one is that it seems very possible to me that a locally controlled education system is going to uh, be worse at things like producing kids that, uh, you know, know math well, say, or perform well on standardized tests in math and maybe does a better job of, uh, you know, inculcating both knowledge and norms of, of like civic participation and, uh, you know, other things that we value about communities. So uh, I, I'd have to delve a lot deeper in the literature, but I, I would just say that, that like, math and science scores aren't everything. Um, but, but I would also say that I, I think that w what I would want Goldstein to uh, to wrestle with, and maybe that I, what I would want you to wrestle mm -hmm. with, um, it, you know, let's say, let's concede that a national curriculum is in some ways uh, superior, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say that it, it educates kids better in 
in math and science, and let's say that the civic education is actually uh, equal, right? Um, so in one way, this is better. The tension nevertheless exists between uh, a public school system that people are going to buy into and a public school system that people are going to opt out of, right? It could be the case that national, uh, national standards are uh, better and nevertheless drive people out of local public schools and into homeschooling and into private schools. Um, uh, you know, that's not my sense of why people go to, you know, people, what drives people out of local public schools is often that they're unsafe or mediocre or have bad teachers or have lots of poor kids in them whom they don't want their kids to associate with, often for reasons that they, you know, think are pretty valid. Um, I have all sorts of sympathy for why people leave local public schools. Um, uh -huh. You know, that said, I don't think it's because they feel disempowered in their ability to influence the curriculum. Um, I mean, uh, Look, that's probably true of a lot of homeschoolers, but the vast majority of people who right. opt out of public school are opting out for parochial or private schools. Um, they're not opting right. out to school at home. So I don't think the people in New Haven who are choosing the Foot School or the Cold Spring School or things like that are doing it because they feel they'll have more parental say. I think they're doing it because they think that, that their kids will go to better school. Um, yeah. I, I also wonder about this, you know, the peer effect that, that Goldstein writes about. Um, I wonder if that really outweighs, if that benefit... Uh, really outweighs the cost of having all of the people who are now homeschooling and, and going to private school, putting their kids in the public school system. Um, in other words, all these right. people are paying taxes like everybody else into the public school system and not not taxing the system by having their kids in it. And I wonder yeah. uh, how it would actually shake out. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say about Hartigal, I wonder what you think about this, is that... Uh, She's making, uh, she's very much making a diversity-based argument, and there is certainly a diversity-based argument to be made that if you're going to, uh, if you're going to a diverse public school, you're interacting with different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. uh, she would argue that you have these good effects from it that you grow up to be uh, more empathetic with different kinds of people, and you have a, more of a commitment to diversity, which uh, some people might contest is a good thing, but I would say it is a good thing. Um, at, at the same time, I think that she uh, doesn't really give another argument it's due, and that is that, you know, one version of a diverse society is that people uh, interact with different kinds of people in elementary and high school, right? Um, but another vision of a diverse society is that uh, we have people running religious Catholic schools, mm -hmm. and we have people mm -hmm. running Jewish schools, and we have people running all sorts of different kinds of, of schools, right. and people coming to adulthood with very different perspectives and getting the wisdom of very different communities and that there's value in that diversity. Well, and it, yeah, the diversity among groups rather than within them. Um, and Right, I mean, yeah. Um, you know, personally, having gone to Catholic schools, uh, one effect of growing up in Catholic school was just sort of rebelling against the church and not wanting to get confirmed, which presumably wasn't what the Catholic schools were after. Right. Uh, at, at the same time, I've certainly gleaned different wisdom from the Catholic tradition that I never would have gotten um, otherwise. And, you know, when Goldstein writes about her own experience in public school and right. how uh, she benefited from going to this diverse public school, I would argue that if Dana Goldstein and I were to uh, were to do a blogging heads and I was sort of articulating what I got from Catholic schools and she was articulating what she got from her diverse public schools, uh, there is value in, in in our ideas meeting. And, right, there's no uh, reason her experience has to be normative. Like, she's the one who got the rich experience. Everyone else just got these narrow parochial experiences. I, I agree that that's, that's a short-sighted way to look at it. I mean, I will say as a parent that um, who's trying to raise a religiously and culturally um, educated and aware uh, Jewish daughter, but also uh -huh. a uh, civic-minded civic uh, young urbanist daughter, that yeah. I think the responsible parenting is, um, you know, which one strives for and hopefully achieves um, in some measure, is has to pay attention to both. I mean, that that is that is our project in America, um, is that it's it's I think America is richest when people do belong to some meaningful subculture, um, religious or other or otherwise or political or racial or or you know, God forbid, like sports centered. Um, uh, but but that they also feel attached to the common project, and you know I I guess what my own personal animus towards a, a lot of people on both the right and the left of, of homeschooling, which I think I share with Dana Goldstein to some extent, is just that a lot of them yeah. seem to scorn the common 
part of the project, especially on the left, for example, um, where, and, and I think this just is more, redounds more to our um, detriment and kind of our, you know, this is, looks worse on the left because we're supposed to be, I think, uh, historically the carrier of the populist uh, and, and demotic uh, strain. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you have people who just think, oh, those silly public schools, you know, it, you know, it's like the people like, I'm not going to shop at, you know, Stop and Shop or Kroger's or what, you know, it's only Whole Foods for me. I mean, that's a cliche to make fun of at this point, but there really is something about the people who think of themselves as liberals, but go through their days ensuring that they never have to brush sleeves with the riffraff that I think is pretty, right. is pretty loathsome. And I, I think that good parenting inevitably um, means finding out how to be part of your little special family project or small community project, but then also the, the big project. Yeah, well, I, I certainly agree with that as a general principle. And, uh, and yeah, maybe that is a good place to end, sure. I think, run through our topic. So it was, uh, yeah, it was great. I hope we do it again tomorrow. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank Good talking to you as always. It was, it was a, a, a delightful Blogging Heads debut. Excellent. All right. All right.